Look at me and tell me what you see. I look at you and tell you what I feel. Look at me and tell me what you see. I look at you and tell you what I feel. It's actually pretty damn watchable. Now, if you excuse me. I'm off to drink the shame away. See you next time. Oh, hello. As you can see, the uh, last series of movies kind of took it out of me mentally. Let's do something different this time. So, as I said, today's going to be different. We're not looking at a film series, but a single film. We're going to be looking at the Hellblazer adaption, Constantine. The movie opens with a quote. Who said it? When was it said? Who knows? Wow, Mexico's looking pretty fucked up. Looks more like Mad Max. Some locals are digging around the ruins until one breaks through the floor. He finds a Nazi flag and inside is the aforementioned Spear of Destiny, which was apparently forged in Mount Doom as the guy goes all golem on us. He wanders off and is immediately hit by a car with such speed and force that the guy is embedded into the engine block instead of completely liquefying his skeleton. Then a mark appears on his arm meaning he is now some kind of possessed demon thing and he promptly runs off leading to the opening titles. Now I gotta admit, that was a pretty good opening. Let's just hope they don't do anything stupid to mess it up. We move to Los Angeles and a mother finds she's starring in an Exorcist remake. <laughs> Yeah, I'd scream too. And our hero arrives to deal with the situation. Oh yeah, here he comes. Ke Keanu Reeves? No, 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 no. Where's Constantine? Reeves is like his sidekick, right? Right? Oh god. So, Constantine has been called by his priest friend to help exercise the girl we saw. And the first of many cigarettes is lit. So at least that's consistent. But Keanu Reeves? Really? They go to check on Pazuzu and Constantine takes a rather different approach to Father Merrin. I do like the idea of Constantine carrying around a keyring of different religious charms to deal with all the faiths. It's a clever touch. Constantine proceeds to straddle the young girl. Nothing wrong there. And then antagonises her. This is Constantine. John Constantine. Constantine, however, is surprised that it didn't work and is then attacked by the girl's neck. Holy shit! I don't care how possessed she is, Constantine still just punched her square in the neck. That's just gotta hurt. And because her neck now has teeth, he concludes that a three foot mirror is needed. I may have been a bit harsh on Keanu Reeves. And besides, it's not like the film's gonna suddenly introduce someone who's skin peelingly awful. This is Kramer. Chaz Kramer, asshole. Shia LaBeouf, really? You're testing my patience, movie. Shia LaBeouf is supposed to be Constantine's longtime friend, Chaz Chandler. Chains to Chaz Kramer in the movie for some unknown reason. I get to play Kramer. You can't play Kramer. I am Kramer. Apparently, he's Constantine's apprentice. However, he acts more like this. Hey, you want I should dig up some bones for you? Anything you say, Spike? Because you and me is pals. That's right, isn't it, Spike? Constantine tells him to move the car, which he does. About a foot. So, nothing bad's gonna happen there. And then it's time to start some exercising. They get the mirror and set it up elaborately. Close your eyes. And whatever happens, don't look. Oh, come on! Why would you say that? That's like telling someone don't think of elephants. <laughs> you see? So things go crazy with the girl getting loose, and then we find out what the mirror was for. Free boss. See? Now that's something the real Constantine would do. That, I like. The demon didn't like that much. 
Constantine attempts to chuck it out the window as the demon starts to break loose of the mirror. Uh, guys, just turn the mirror slightly. You don't need to break the poor woman's window any further. And as the mirror flies, it inevitably lands on the car. But the girl is saved, the day is saved, and Constantine's run out of smokes. And that's when he notices a picture of the spear from the beginning. This is where Constantine is basically set on track for the actual plot of the movie. However, we never really find out what, if any, connection the girl had with the spear. And we see this guy, who's also an important player in this, and I have no idea what he's doing in a rundown apartment somewhere in LA. Because the place, or the girl, has no real connection to the bad guy's overarching plan. Maybe I'm overthinking it, but it seems like the writers could have used something more significant to get Constantine into the main plot. Constantine can tell something was wrong with that exorcism, and asks his priest friend, who also has psychic visions, obviously, to see if he can find anything unusual. Chaz is complaining about the mirror explosion he had. John, why would you do that if you don't sell my car? But the car's still looking pretty good considering. We then move to the other protagonist of the film, Angela Dodson, making confession. I killed a man today. Now that's how you start confession, by freaking out the priest. Especially because she waits a rather long time to reveal that she's a police officer. So I think that priest made the biggest sigh of relief since the resignation of the Pope. You're joking. The Pope. Oh my god. And later that night, we see Angela's twin sister, Isabel, is awoken in her room at the mental hospital by a creepy voice. And she makes her way to the roof. Which she finds incredibly easy to do in a mental hospital. Turns out Isabel has the same mark we saw on the guy with the spear at the beginning, and after removing her wristband, she jumps, smashing through the window below. Which leaves her in surprisingly good condition considering the shards of glass. Elsewhere, with Constantine, he's busy coughing up blood. And this is the secondary plot of the film. Constantine is very much dying at this point. It should be said that a good portion of this film takes influence from the Hellblazer story, Dangerous Habits, in which Constantine is dying and he tries to find ways to avoid his death and descent into hell. It's a pretty awesome story, but I doubt that's why they chose it as the plot for this film. Because Constantine is very much a chain smoker, and you can't have the hero of your film smoking, so what do they do? They show that killing him, which nips the issue directly in the bud. It's actually a pretty damn clever workaround to keep Constantine smoking, because if they remove his cigarettes, that really would be the last straw. So at the hospital, Constantine is given the news he has only a few months left to live, which he has a rather Constantine-like reaction to. Yeah, that's a good idea. Also in the hospital, Angela arrives to see her sister's dead body, and Rachel Weisz's acting here is really good. It's a nice touch that she carefully removes hairs from her face, and you really feel some added emotion and weight to the situation. It's even better when you find out that she's acting alongside a lifelike replica of herself. That's very convincing and thousands of internet perverts desperately begin their quest for that replica. Angela's convinced that Isabel didn't kill herself for reasons we'll find out in a bit. And then, on her way out, bumps into our ray of sunshine. You're going down. Not if I can help it. Somewhere in a field of cattle, our guy with the spear is making his way through, and manages to kill the whole lot of them. I know it's in Mexico or wherever, but you'd have thought massive cattle destruction wouldn't go unnoticed. We're then introduced to another character, Beeman, who acts like Constantine's Q, and as an added bit of quirky, his payment is these things. Oh, okay. Much obliged, thank you. After supplying Constantine with more cigarettes, we get a rundown of his gadgets. Bullet shavings from the assassination attempt on the Pope. Bullet shavings? Would they really be of any use? They're hardly holy. Plus, they tried to kill the Pope, and failed. Seems pretty crap to me. You're jogging. The Pope. Oh my god. There's also some holy water, naturally. And then there's this thing. Screech Beetle from Emmettable. Yeah, it's funny to you, but to the Fallen it's like nails on a chalkboard. Fuck the Fallen. I think anyone would find that little bastard irritating. And the PA de la Resistance? Constantine explains the situation to Beeman. I just pulled a soldier demon out of a little girl. Looked like he was trying to come through. Now we're finger puppets to them, John, not doorways. That brings me back to what I was saying earlier. Constantine and Beeman both agree that the demon trying to come through the girl is weird. 
but it doesn't have anything to do with the main plot. Or the bad guy's evil scheme for that matter. It's merely a way for our main characters to find that plot. Anything else? Wouldn't happen to have anything for you. Nice. Cigarettes and coughs are present. Good combo there. Sometime later, Constantine is parked outside a church and Shaz is whining. Then why don't I apprentice something besides driving then, John? John? And as Constantine enters the church, this is something I need to talk about. This film deals with religion, but it's very much from a Catholic perspective, with all the Catholic dogma that comes with it. But this is one of the worst changes, mainly because Hellblazer talked about religion, but it very rarely pinned down just one. It basically used all religions and spiritualities. Constantine insists on being seen and rude to Angela, who happens to be there at the same time. First come, first served. So you're rude no matter where you are. He's rude to her because he wants to be seen first. Not sure why when they just see different people anyway. Angela speaks to the priest about Isabel getting a funeral and Constantine speaks with Gabriel. Yes, that Gabriel. Angela is told that Isabel can't have a Catholic funeral because she committed suicide. God was the only one she ever believed loved her. Sorry. Even though that part of Catholic law no longer applies, and the fact that she was in a mental institute would certainly imply she wasn't exactly compass mentis. Back with Constantine and Gabriel, and my god, this scene has some of the worst, cringe-inducing dialogue of the whole movie. It's badly written and badly acted. For example... I never asked to see. I was born with this curse. Let's just skip it. Here's the cliff notes. You are going to die young because... You smoked 30 cigarettes a day since you were 15. And you're going to go to hell because of the life you took. You're fucked. After some odd interactions with Angela, Constantine walks off into the rain. Meanwhile, Constantine's priest friend, Father Hennessy, is using his psychic abilities to search for anything unusual, and he finds it. Isabel. And more discoveries are made as Angela is watching the security footage of her sister. Constantine. Which makes all her phones go crazy for a reason that's not really explained. Back in the rain, Constantine is chugging cough suppressants, and you ever feel like fate is dicking with you? <coughs> and that suppressant is doing wonders for his cough, don't you think? And then a bum asks him for a light. Hey buddy, got a light? Man, LA hobos are mean. It's pretty clear he's not a normal hobo. So how does Constantine deal with a powerful demon? Must be the holy fender of Antioch. So now Constantine's off to see someone else, Papa Midnight. And Chaz wants to get in on it, giving us some exposition in the process. Papa Midnight is a crusader for good. He swore the oath of neutrality. Sure, you can get in. I can get in? If you can get in. After that cryptic response, we find out what he meant by that. Two frogs on a bench. Two frogs on a bench. No, no, no. I'm with, I'm, I'm with the guy you just... That's a pretty clever idea. It gets across the mystical aspects of the bar quite nicely. Not sure how the hell it works, but I like it. Constantine makes his way through the club and we see Angel and Demon Halfbreeds mingling together. <laughs> That's a nice touch. Constantine sits down for a chat with Midnight. You're the one soul he'd come up here himself to collect. I really like the depiction of Papa Midnight. Granted, I haven't read much with Midnight, but I understand he's a pretty big character. But what they did with him here works well and fits in with the aesthetic. I'd rather they change him like this, than not have him in a Hellblazer film. Plus, there's a little bit of dialogue at the start. Perhaps battling forgeries has ended up being bad for your health. Midnight, Jesus. I thought the thing was authentic. Which sets up nicely the kind of relationship he has with Constantine. Constantine explains what he's seen to Midnight, but he dismisses it. Demons stay in hell. Angels in heaven. The great detente of the original superpowers. Thanks for the history lesson, Midnight. He then asks to use the chair, but Midnight refuses. Forgetting the fact that it would almost certainly kill you. You know I am neutral. And as long as the balance is maintained, I take no sides. This is one of the few problems I have with Midnight and his supposed neutrality. 
because he's not neutral. By not allowing Constantine the use of some mystical item, he's actively stopping him. And then Balthazar, our coin flipping guy from the beginning, shows up to sample that delicious scenery. That expression alone has made my entire night. Constantine threatens to send him back to where he came from, but Midnight steps in. And there is some more wonderful dialogue from Balthazar. Word is, you're on your way down. Fresh meat. Finger looking good. I love the way this guy is playing it. It's that I don't give a shit, I'm playing it this way kind of acting. Or the Michael Sheen as I like to call it. Constantine has a coughing fit and swiftly makes his way back to his apartment, where he's doing what you'd expect, smoking and drinking alone. Welcome to my life. Yeah, kill the bastards, I hate spiders. <clears throat> no spiders were harmed in the making of this film. Under the supposed instruction from Isabel, Angela has shown up to ask Constantine some questions. He is his usual charming self, but Angela insists. Please. Considering the fact that Constantine's name was the last thing her sister said, wouldn't she be treating him more like a suspect right now? Constantine grudgingly lets Angela in, and she says that her sister was murdered and didn't commit suicide. Yeah, what kind of mental patient kills herself? That's just crazy. He has a good point there. Yes, Angela knows her sister better than he does, but no one has really considered her mental state in all of this. Angela is adamant that Isabel didn't kill herself, which Constantine is incredibly tactful about. To understand what that means, that means if she'd taken her own life... Her soul would go straight to hell, where she'd be ripped apart over and over in screaming brutal agony for all eternity. That it. Wow, that was harsh. And considering that's what awaits Constantine, you'd think he'd be a little bit more understanding of the situation. Or, you know, not be a complete dick. To a police officer. Angela leaves pretty quickly after that, but something makes Constantine follow. So now Constantine has to convince Angela of everything he knows in the space of a few minutes. It seems like there could have been more done with the relationship between these two, because he's a dick to her, and then he immediately has to ally himself with her after. It's all a bit rushed to get a connection between these two. A little bit more of them meeting out of chance would have helped. And while they talk, Angela doesn't notice the lights going out all around them. Seeing the window filled with religious paraphernalia is still lit up, Constantine knows it's not just a blackout, and prepares something to fight off whatever's coming. That was pretty cool, and it's a good illustration of the attention to detail I like here. The cloth Constantine lights and uses as a weapon is supposedly a piece of Moses' shroud given to him by Beeman. But of course, unless you listen to the director's commentary or do any research, you'd never know that. So I gotta commend the filmmakers on their attention to detail. Another example is Constantine's lighter, which I just happen to have right here. With the coin of Saint Benedict on the front, the patron saint of fighting witchcraft, and the Latin phrase on the side meaning let justice be done though the world burn. It all builds up the setting in subtle ways to convince you it's real. Anyway, back to the movie, and Constantine has an idea. I really believe she wouldn't commit suicide. Never in a million years. Let's see if she's in hell. Well-timed bust there. They go back to Angela's apartment, and Constantine plans to literally go to hell and see if Isabel is there. I would have thought that'd be like finding a needle in a haystack, but hey, what do I know? He selects the cat to help him with his spell, and tells Angela she'll need to leave the apartment for it to work. Be careful with that cat. And just like that, Constantine is in hell, with nothing to defend himself but a holy water ampule. And the design of hell is quite excellent, with it being a mirror of the normal world. But because this is really the only time characters explore it, Possibly a little wasted, as I think there was more potential to be creative here. Constantine walks around as we see the real inhabitants of hell. Now that looks like a pretty horrible place to be. Very few depictions of hell in cinema just go all out for the chaotic Hieronymus Bosch style affair. Hell in other movies is all metaphysical and philosophical. Sometimes it's just nice to see tradition. 
Constantine is noticed by the other residents of Hell and they give chase as he sees Isabel. She pulls off her hospital tag as Constantine races to get to it, and just as he grabs it, he smashes the holy water against himself. Now doing it this way keeps Hell more mysterious and better used later on and it leaves it up to the audience to determine how long and just what Constantine had to go through to get Isabel's tag. It also puts the audience in the same shoes as Angela as she is the audience surrogate which would allow Constantine to explain to Angela all about Hell without the audience getting the same information twice. Elsewhere Father Hennessy has found his way to the city morgue looking for Isabel. He gets to the freezer and does something which I hope is his psychic power and not exercising some kind of strange fetish. <sighs> After seeing the mark which freaks him out, he tries to drink from his flask but nothing comes out of it. He runs into a liquor store and starts trying to drink from any bottle at hand but gets nothing, which is a really subtle but great effect. And as Balthazar walks through the store, we realise what's happening and as a last resort, Hennessy grabs a corkscrew and proceeds to stab the symbol into his palm as he dies drowning in alcohol. See, now that made Balthazar intimidating. Frankly, that should have almost been his introduction, starting from a place of power and menace. He's a demon for God's sake, so we need to see him being evil and dangerous. And not doing that! Think. Constantine and Angela are at a food vendor, and this is where we get the history for Constantine. I could see things. Things humans aren't supposed to see. Well, in this universe anyway, it's pretty much a completely different origin story for him. <laughs> well, that was just odd. Also, she's not really invisible. Constantine sees what she really looks like, but she's still there. What the hell are the other bus passengers thinking seeing that? Constantine also tells about how he was treated as mentally ill. And how this led him to committing suicide. So this is why he's condemned to hell. Officially I was dead for two minutes. But when you cross over, take it from me. Two minutes of hell is a lifetime. You'd think that would make him more empathetic when he heard about Isabel for the first time. Angela gets a phone call and she and Constantine go to a crime scene which is where Hennessy died. Constantine uses a cloth to take the image Hennessy carved into his hand and he calls Beeman to look into it. Good. Bye. Did he really need to draw it? It's a circle with a cross through it, how difficult is that to remember? Angela takes Constantine to Isabel's room and they search for some kind of clue, but Constantine thinks Angela is holding something back. What are you afraid of? What did she do, Angela? What did she do? I don't know! She seems a bit overly resistant to help, but it serves to show just how guilty she's feeling. Angela remembers how she and her sister used to write messages on glass. Then we learn of Hell's Bible. They have Bibles in Hell. Paints a different view of Revelations. Says the world will not end by God's hand, but be reborn in the embrace of the damned. So wait a second, am I supposed to believe that reads the Bible? Yes, I know there are other demons, but really, why would they care? But I think it's time for a quick installment of... Can I overthink it? Firstly, who wrote it? Is it the same people who wrote the original Bible? That seems a little bipolar. And if it paints a different picture of Revelations, does it tell anything else differently? Does it show the charming snake given a bad rap by an apple thief? I'm not saying it's a bad idea, I'm just saying it's poorly implemented because it's never mentioned again after this. So anyway, they get Beeman to look up the passage and find out what it says. He talks about how the son of the devil is planning to escape hell and destroy the earth via a ritual that uses the spear. So same old, same old, right? However, as well as needing a powerful psychic like Isabel, there's a twist. Beeman abruptly ends the call as the equipment around him turns on. And then he has a rather bad eye problem. <laughs> they get to the bowling alley and discover what has happened to Beeman. Yeah, that's a pretty nasty way to go. 
and still serves to make Balthazar intimidating. So seriously, why the fuck did he have to do that? I keep mentioning it, but it seriously screws up his character throughout the film. He's intimidating and mysterious. His introduction didn't need to be there, it's stupid and overacted. Elsewhere, the guy from Mexico has gotten close to Los Angeles, and even though he's walked who knows how far, he now decides that he needs a vehicle. Back with Constantine, who's watching the emergency services leave with Beeman, Angela comes back to talk, and she says that she used to see things just like Isabel, but she stopped seeing because she never admitted it to anyone and denied it to herself. But Constantine tells her why that's a good thing. Your sister embraced her gift. You've denied yours. Denial is a better idea. It's why you're still alive. Stick with me. That'll change. I need another ghost following me around. Now that is something very central to Hellblazer. The less you know the supernatural, the less it can hurt you. And Constantine saying he doesn't want another ghost following him is a subtle reference to the comics, where he is haunted by the people who died because of him. Which certainly evokes an atmosphere close to the comics. Angela confesses that although she used to see things, she refused to back her sister up. So now that Constantine has confirmed everything she saw was real, that has made her not only guilty, but also to feel responsible for her sister being at the hospital in the first place. Angela asks Constantine to help her see like she used to, and he has a solution for that. Running a bath, apparently. So do I have to take the rest of my clothes off or can I leave them on? On the spot. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Although it does perpetuate a love interest thing going on. Constantine plans to do for Angela what he did earlier to get to hell. However, for it to work, she's going to need to be fully submerged. Which is one hell of a trust exercise. So she's placed in the water. Obvious parallels to baptism is obvious. After a while, Angela can't hold her breath any longer and needs to get up. Yep, that's the ultimate what the fuck you doing face. To which Constantine keeps her held down. But just before you can add another sister to the death list, this happens. Angela has now gained her psychic abilities back, which she immediately runs off to give an example of. She goes to where Beeman died and picks something up from the grating. Everyone say it with me now. No shit, Sherlock. Now that Constantine knows that Balthazar has been skewing the balance, he's kitting out for a battle, with frankly one of the coolest weapons I've ever seen. God, I love that thing. They decide to take the fight to Balthazar at his office. Yeah, he works in a swanky office building. Who knew? Constantine places Hennessy's necklace on Angela for protection. And there's some more teasing of a love interest, but no matter how much they make fun of it, I just wish they'd stop doing it. And then Constantine bursts in on Balthazar like a fiery Kool-Aid man. Oh yeah! And he chucks a holy water in his face in a pretty cool looking effect. That's better. Go natural. Just... just shut up, dude. Constantine told Angela to stay put, which she does for about, oh, three seconds. And she takes off the amulet as well. I know what's about to happen to her, and frankly, it's deserved after being that stupid. Balthazar has Constantine by the throat, but he takes out one badass pair of knuckle dusters. See, now that's how you do your holy relics. Balthazar is down for the count, and even I gotta admit that Constantine is a pretty clever way of getting info from him. What are you doing? I'm reading you your last rites. Spare me your remedial incantations. You do know what it is to truly be forgiven, to be welcomed into the kingdom of God. Demon in heaven. Love to be a fly on that wall. That's actually something I've never thought of. It's pretty clever. Plus it gives us this bit of awesome acting. Grant your child entry into thy kingdom in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. At the last minute, Balthazar gives up the info. Whatever killed the Son of God will give birth to the Son of the Devil. And then Constantine is perfectly in character. You have to ask for a solution to be forgiven. <sighs> It's little shining lights of dialogue like that that keep elevating this movie and making me think the filmmakers really cared about what they were doing. Angela comes in and Balthazar reveals his secret agenda. She was my 
only mission. And you brought her right to us. Holy shit! No witty comeback, no action movie line. That was fucking awesome! However, Balthazar, with his head in a million pieces, is still alive somehow, and it's revealed he's been working with an unknown party, who promptly just finishes the guy off. So, they can't be all bad. Constantine and Angela are making their way out of the building, but Constantine notices the amulet is missing, which has a bigger effect on Angela than you might think. <laughs> Holy crap! See? Now that's how you kidnap somebody. Although, why didn't they do that with Isabel? Yeah, they didn't have the spear, but generally, if you can pull someone through a building, you do. Now Constantine has pretty much had enough, and after knocking out the bouncer, he shotguns his way in to see Midnight. Have you lost what little mind you have? And Midnight proves he's not just a bar manager. But Constantine manages to convince him to help. Consider it a last request. You play a dangerous game. And then we finally see the chair. 200 souls pass through this wooden steel at Sing Sing. Yep, it's an old electric chair. And what else is there to do in an electric chair but this? <laughs> However, instead of killing him instantly, Constantine gets a vision of our Mexican friend and his journey to Los Angeles, with him reaching the hospital which is where Angela is being taken. And that's when the vision takes Constantine by surprise. I like that when the Mexican guy was looking around suspiciously, he was actually sensing Constantine watching him. It opens up a few interesting questions about the power of the chair, and when he grabs Constantine, it shows how the guy has grown in power. All three of our heroes are preparing to get Angela back and fight the demons who are protecting her, but Chaz is actually useful here and has the idea to turn the sprinklers into holy water dispensers, using a specific holy relic. So you wouldn't happen to have one of those enchanted crosses sitting around here in a cabinet or something maybe we could take with us? Look, John, no offense, I, I just don't think that it's a great idea, you know, you go on a solo mission to save the world. I, that's, that's what I, that's my vote. I love the way he says that, because he makes it sound like he's saying, look, unless you've got one of these crosses, you're on a suicide mission. So Chaz is allowed to come along and help, but, but Midnight actually does have one of those crosses. So, a bit of pointless, confusing conflict for you. What are you doing? Pray. Pray. Again, I do enjoy some of the humour, and it's never really out of place. Back with Angela, she falls into the pool where her sister died. And why is that window not fixed yet? Seriously, that's just bad maintenance. Angela's clearly confused, and then she's attacked by our Mexican friend, but he's learnt a few bullet-resistant tricks. And I keep asking, what must the general public be thinking? This is a hospital. Where is every non-demon in this world? Chaz and Constantine arrive at the hospital and realise a lot of half-breed demons are waiting for them. What is it? Hellspeak. It's not Hellspeak. The language is that of Mordor. And while Chaz goes to sanctify the water, Constantine gets to give a badass speech. You are in violation of the balance. You immediately... Or I will deport you. All of you. Please work, please work, don't look like a twat, don't look like a twat. Fortunately, the holy water takes effect to a devastating degree. Holy water? Isn't that the same as like dousing someone in acid? I mean, I know they're demons, but that's a really fucked up thing to do to people. And then the shooting begins, and it's pretty damn badass. However, I can't help thinking this was used to pitch the video game. Yes, it exists. I mean, just look at this. All it needs is a health bar and ammo counter. Meanwhile, Angela is currently being drowned. And because drowning takes you to hell, apparently, she appears there and is greeted by Mamon, who disappointingly looks like any other demon in hell. We've been hearing all about how badass he is, and there's really nothing that makes him stand out. Hell, the guy only has two lines. 
Constantine and Chaz get into the pool area and find what they think is Angela drowned. However, she's full on exorcist instead. They get her out of the pool and start to try and exorcise her by chanting Latin. Now I'm no religious expert, but what I do know is that apart from a few other Latin phrases, Constantine keeps repeating the phrase in nomine patres e filia e spiritu sancti, which means in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. I mention this because Constantine is supposed to be an expert in exorcism. When the usual stuff doesn't work, they call him. And this is all he can do? Just spout Latin you'd hear at church on Sunday? What happened to the charms? The mirror? Some kind of unorthodox method for this? It's just a bit lazy considering how neatly it was set up at the beginning. And at the end of the exorcism, seemingly won, Chaz is killed. <coughs> it's very sad. Although, it should be said that in the comics, it's almost a running joke that Chaz is the only one of Constantine's friends not to die. Now Constantine is pissed, and using the tattoos on his arm, performs some kind of ritual to bring the hidden party, as he says, into the light. And you'll never guess who it is. So yeah, turns out Gabriel has gone rather megalomaniacal, and is the one helping Mamon cross over. Which I have to admit is a pretty good twist. Shall we find out what her plan of world destruction actually involves? Murderers and rapists and molesters. All of you, you just have to repent. And God takes you into his bosom. It's not fair. If sweet, sweet God loves you so, then I'll make you worthy of his love. Now, it's your usual crazy bullshit. But she's not just a moustache twirling baddie. She doesn't even think she's the bad guy. She genuinely thinks she's bettering mankind and doing a great job. This is how you do an antagonist well, and it's how a real person would think, which is weird because she's not human. Gabriel throws Constantine away, causing him to smash into the far door, and she begins the ritual. Constantine begins to pray, but as expected, his prayers go unanswered, so he decides to do something that will get answered. Remember what Midnight said? You're the one soul he'd come up here himself to collect. Yep, he's gonna slit his wrists, and as Constantine dies, time stops just at the right moment. And now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the best thing in this movie, Peter Stormare as Lucifer. But seriously, <clears throat> excuse me, this is one of the best scenes in the film, and Stormare plays it perfectly, with just the right amount of sliminess to make Lucifer feel like an unpleasant person to be around. It's all it's a family. Family's doing just fine. Busy, 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 busy. Need a vacation. <laughs> Word is that kid of yours is a chip off the old block. Well... One does what one can. Constantine tells him that Mamon has the Spear of Destiny and what he intends to do with it, which, as you can imagine, Lucifer's not too happy about. <laughs> and because he's Lucifer, he ain't gonna open no stinking door. He picks up Angela, but Gabriel still thinks she's working for the good guys. I will smite thee in his honour. Looks like somebody doesn't have your back anymore. Lucifer simultaneously takes care of Gabriel and sends Mamon back, which really shows how insignificant they both were if their plan was taken apart that quickly and that easily by Lucifer. Lucifer offers Constantine a life extension, however Constantine wants Isabel to go to heaven instead, which Lucifer allows. Fine. It's done. I do love how goofy he was there, but because Constantine sacrificed himself for Isabel, he is now allowed into heaven. Which is very Hollywood happy ending nonsense, but I know why they did it, to appeal to people who aren't familiar with Hellblazer, but it's still very Disney-esque in my opinion. Lucifer isn't happy that Constantine managed to cheat the system, and instead of letting him go, he cures him of the tumours. I do hope he healed his wrist wounds too, otherwise it's going to be a very short resurrection. Chance to prove that your soul truly belongs in hell. Angela is now safe, and Gabriel, it turns out, is now human. And she gives Constantine the choice to end her life. I assume because she doesn't want to be human, and so she can go to heaven. But really, isn't that basically suicide by cop in this case? It doesn't matter anyway, as Constantine refuses. Ever wondered what getting hit in the face feels like to someone who's never felt pain? That's called pain. I think that sums it up nicely. 
Constantine gives Angela the spear to hide somewhere and he starts chewing nicotine gum, which is definitely not a Constantine thing to do, but it serves to get the anti-smoking message in there. So that was Constantine. It was goofy, it was over the top, and this is one of my favourite films of all time. Yes, I'm serious. I can't explain it, but I love this film. You already know what bad I have to say about this film, but I have just as much good to say about it. The attention to detail is amazing. You can really see the filmmakers tried as hard as they could to make it resemble the comic. I believe that most of the changes were due to pressure from the higher up companies, and for what it's worth, the movie gets the atmosphere pitch perfect with the comics, which may have had an effect on its reception with audiences. As when people go to see a comic book movie, they expect action. So trying to sell a comic book movie that barely has action, and is more of a mystery thriller, you can see why it didn't take off. It's not a perfect film, but I enjoy it, and if you enjoy something, you must be willing to critique it. Well, after that, I think I'm ready to get back to what we're used to. I mean, unless something really annoying shows up in the next minute.